Okay. Good. So to start off with, would you like to just say your name and where you are? Hi, uh, my name is Jeff Teachworth. I'm in New Orleans and I'm the assistant director of the Gestalt Institute and Relationship Center of New Orleans. Okay. And the first question is, who are you as a human being? And that can be <laughs> anything you would like to share in terms of passions, values, principles, qualities of yourself, whatever comes up for you. Okay. Well, uh, I, uh, I plead the Fifth Amendment to any question that feels so directly, uh, deeply and invasive. But after I experience that, then I feel deeper in me. Uh, very comfortable. Um, I am a people helper uh, by birth, I believe. Um, my mother, Ann Teachworth, uh, made a name for herself in the Gestalt community um, back when, uh, I think in the early 70s, uh, she began to um, get involved with it. Uh, she ended up um, uh, opening up a, a world of training and seminars and workshops uh, much um, similar to what uh, my friend Morgan Goodlander does in the Gestalt Institute of San Francisco. In fact, Morgan is a uh, student of the Gestalt Institute of New Orleans under my mother. And um, uh, so I, I was able to go to a lot of workshops and seminars and training over the years uh, there. Um, one thing in particular that seems to have become more of a niche for me is working with relationships. Um, that became uh, the subject of my mother's book that she published in 1997 called Why We Pick the Mates We Do. And she developed those theories after working with uh, people who were in relationships. Uh, as my mom would say, um, there wasn't really a formalized couple counseling uh, type of structure prior to uh, to, to, to her beginning to uh, uh, set it up more that way. Um, she's on YouTube if you wanted to look her up and you could uh, find her discussing that. But the um, process of working with couples is a, is a combination of gestalt and um, something called redecision therapy. Um, <clears throat> um, the, um, the ultimate goal of it is to is to get people to re-examine uh, almost a, uh, an unconscious archetype of relationships that they formed during their childhood. Um, and it's not um, the Freudian one that the man marries his mother and the woman marries her father or things about attraction. Um, it's, uh, it's different, and we can talk about that as, as we go forward, but I utilize that as well as what I would consider um, in the beginning of meeting uh, a couple, something like a, a rational, emotive kind of uh, approach, which is, you know, the structure of people's belief systems sometimes will present itself early on in the meeting. Um, and by challenging those in a familiar way after having established some rapport, um, it really helps bring people forward. Um, a lot of times the people that meet have uh, not been to any counseling at all about their relationship. So in that process, I used my mom's uh, theories as well as uh, some core gestalt uh, methodology. So, uh, mm -hmm. That's, that's and sort of sort of more than the, the what you do, though. I mean, there, there is definitely, obviously, reasons and deeper reasons that, that we do the things we do the way we do. But who are you? <laughs> OK, sure. I, I did get into who I am in terms of the, the work I do or the or the approach that I take. Um, you know, maybe uh, I've feel like I'm a human being just like everybody else and uh, the struggles that we take on a on a conscious and super conscious level have been the same challenges that people have faced for a long time. Um, I consider myself to be a, a kind, warm, loving, open-minded 
uh, people person. And um, I, uh, I've lived here all my life in the New Orleans area. I was um, uh, one of six kids and all of us are boys. There's, there's no uh, daughters, no women in the, in the, uh, in the family there. And I think that um, in a lot of ways, I was uh, sort of a people helper in, in my role as the oldest of the, of the six. And I think that I had to fine tune that into uh, my career in terms of knowing what the differences are between, um, you know, boundary problems and, and things like that. Um, I'm a grandfather. I have um, one grandson who is almost 12. Uh, he's a joy. I'm divorced, yet my ex-wife and I are friends. In fact, we're both uh, co-raising our grandson uh, because our daughter, um, Holly, passed away about three years ago uh, from uh, addiction problems. And she had done Sorry well. Thank you. She had done well in that last year. Uh, I think she uh, maybe fell short one time and uh, that one time maybe a friend bumped into her from the other world or something but she got fentanyl and so the fentanyl uh, apparently is what they said um, escalated her into that uh, serious condition where she had died so um, that's been a spiritual um, experience for me um, losing her um, and how uh, how I've dealt with it, I think, has come from a period of grief into a deeper understanding of of the human condition and the importance uh, of each person uh, on the planet. Does that answer it a little bit better, that second paragraph? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah I've, I've also lost a daughter not quite at that same age, very different circumstances, but mm -hmm. it is sort of one of those things that calls for reconsidering a lot of things. It sure does, doesn't it? Yeah. yeah. And I, I'm sort of wondering about a couple of things that you said in terms of we've met with a Russian gentleman who is also a child of a Gestalt Institute. And it's really interesting now that you know as time has passed you are you actually literally grew up in that environment mm -hmm. so i kind of wonder about that part and also a little bit more about the personal things which i think i'll i'll ask about first and then i'll come back to the gestalt stuff if that's okay sure i mean i i am curious who you would say has been one of the most significant influences on you in any aspect of your life who comes to mind? Uh, well, my mother, for sure. Um, mm -hmm. I think that uh, on her uh, life path, she and my dad were married for like, I think, 14 years. And it was uh, their uh, marriage counseling that, that got my mom familiar with Gestalt after they had been counseled uh in in that it was called the yoke fellow institute at that time but um they were using gestalt and i think transactional analysis and maybe you know some other types of methods anyway my mom got interested and stayed and ended up going through a lot of their training and then she uh met um some other people um i forget his name but it was um it's on the tip of my tongue, but he was the uh, Leland Johnson, I think. He was the um, director of the Gestalt Institute of Houston. And uh, he became a mentor of my mom's and he challenged her to open the Gestalt Institute. So I remember Leland. Um, I also remember Ed Hackerson, uh, who was um, involved in the Gestalt community, I believe, or in, in, you know, at that time it I was younger, so I believed him to be, I know he was, uh, he was participating in the workshops and, and perhaps leading something back in the 70s, but uh, he, uh, he was a great guy, 
And um, I think sometimes it, it's it's the, the the vibrational level or the the feel of somebody you know that can teach you more than uh, than words, uh, just a state of being. In fact, I, I've um, told people this before in and out of the counseling office. Um, it's not how much knowledge you accumulate, but it's how you manage what you already have accumulated. Um, so he's a good one. Morgan Goodlander uh, has uh, been a friend for quite a while, and uh, I consider him to be very uh, bright and creative and uh, kind of tricky sometimes in a good way. Um, so uh, he uh, had done some training with the Gestalt Institute here, and I got a chance to know him. And then, uh, you know, I, I didn't talk to him for a while. And then I, I have uh, recently reconnected with him. I know we're all busy. So uh, Joseph Zinker and his, uh, his creative process in Gestalt therapy, um, he came down here and, uh, and, and led a workshop uh, based on uh, his experiences and maybe I think he studied with Fritz Perls directly. So um, he has kind of uh, an interesting way of confronting people kind of in the old style gestalt. Um, Laura Perls came here and, uh, and, and she was very interesting to meet. Um, she had uh, a twinkle in her eye and a certain, a certain magic about her that was, that was very impressive. Um, Lenny, uh, gosh, what's his last name? I feel like I know him so well. He's the uh, director of the Gestalt Institute of Haifa in Israel. And uh, he's come over here uh, uh, several times and led workshops. In fact, Lenny's uh, piece of it is, uh, is kind of how to use humor, sense of humor in the right places. Uh, when you're working with people. And um, so he's been, Lenny Rabbits. Uh, I think that's his name. I hope I'm not confusing not, it with not Lenny, Lenny Kravitz, Kravitz, but I think it's <laughs> Lenny Rabbits, R-A-V-I-C-H, uh, very close. Okay. Right. Uh, so those are some people that have influenced me. Also, there's one and more. how, in, uh, how so? How have they impacted you or? It's hard to say um, mm -hmm. specifically other than, you know, what I'm, mentioned humor with with Lenny or um, uh, maybe a style of confronting with um, Joseph Zinker, uh, something about creativity and and trickiness with Morgan. Um, my mom's uh, influence, I think, and I described this at her uh, at her memorial ceremony when she passed away in 2012 um, was great contact. I feel like uh, my mom's among her many gifts were the ability to make really good contact, have really good rapport. Um, and speaking of that, uh, Richard Bandler, the founder of NLP, uh, spent a lot of time down here and uh, he led workshops and things. And, you know, Richard's uh, intellectuality, his way of sort of systems analysis of the interactions between people and the the suppositions that people make and a sense of, of rapport and, and language. Um, those were, were great. Um, I never met Milton Erickson, but certainly he goes uh, into that mix as well, the famous hypnotist. Um, so, yeah. And I mean, you, you've mentioned some different sort of snapshots of your life, but I am curious what comes up right now as a single event or as a set of circumstances that you would say really shifted you or changed you or impacted you in some way and, and how that impact has played out? Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if I could put it down to any one event. You know, I do remember one time when I was a kid and uh, I remember where I was standing and I think this was before my mom got involved in Gestalt. I must have been maybe eight or nine years old. I was standing by the pantry door where the food is, and that's important to 
to boys in a family, you know, possibly girls, but I'm just going to say all boys, that was important to us. Um, and something happened, and I can remember, you know, perhaps in almost a positive introject kind of way, um, I remember her saying, Jeff, you've got to get control of your temper. And, you know, it was just some moment where I had never considered that there was a me that could get control of me. Uh, you know, mindfulness talks about that uh, using a higher self or an executive function or something where, you, you know, you actually literally have that conscientious separation. And anyway, uh, I remember and thought about that. And it seemed like from that point on, I was different. I was mindful. I was aware of, of, of myself interacting with the world and, um, that's one in particular <laughs> that I remember. Yeah, it's like uh, that meta processing skill set just suddenly comes online. That's mm -hmm. interesting. Yeah, I share it with my clients too. Not that story, but this the idea that um, uh, you know sometimes I work with people with anger management issues. In fact, uh, if I get somebody for anger management, I would say almost all the time it's related to a relationship problem. And so um, sometimes with anger management, I, I think the trick is to get the people to have sort of a, a meta perspective or a, a way of monitoring themselves. And I, I've used the Gestalt empty chairs to help facilitate that. Um, you know, I'll make the suggestion that that there's a, a separate self, a higher self. I'll talk about an executive function is another way of, of talking about uh, how we monitor ourselves. And at some point when I think I'm on track with them, I'll have them put that part in the chair and talk to that part of themselves. And then at some point I'll get them to go over into the chair and reply, knowing that not only am I facilitating the awareness, but I'm also, in some sense, creating a construct for the people to be able to do that. One guy in particular I worked with uh, became such a fan, uh, sort of in that same kind of uh, metamorphosis, aha kind of way. Once he understood this early on in our process, um, and he says, uh, in, in his typical Cajun accent, uh, he goes, Jeff, I have to say, you, you, you're the plumber. I, I've told people, uh, if you have any problems with your anger, you got to go see the plumber. Go see the plumber. And I'm like, why you say the plumber? He's like, because you cleaned out my pipes. But uh, it was that idea of that separate self, that monitoring ability that you know made him realize that he didn't have to be reactive. He could be proactive. He didn't have to get mad if his wife said something, you know, or even for him a, a pebble in the road would hit his windshield and that would be and he did a lot of driving but that would be a sign for him to just automatically lose it and getting in touch with those automatic behaviors and getting sort of a sense to go in there and monitor that and edit that you know even yeah. in terms of a, a computer x out of that you know that's a pretty complex realization for an eight-year-old in front of the cookie pantry it's like oh my god i have choice oh that's that's the that's thing weird. isn't it to uh to to find something that uh is so profound for you you know that as we move along through our lives um i've heard of um somebody told me once of what they called a green dot moment uh, somebody else calls it a another place called it a red dot moment and um, it describes some part of what Gestalt tries to be with its sort of cathartic experience. But it's if you if you had you know yourself drawn as a circle, maybe like a pizza, and one third of it was these are the things I know, and then the next third would be these are the things that I know I don't know. That last third would be the trick spot, which would be these are the things that I don't know that I don't know. But when you get some awareness in that spot, it can be really powerful to, to really shift you. And so, uh, you know, I, I try to have uh, the Gestalt session, each session, have a sense of taking sort of what's offered as, as fragments or as uh, sort of a, 
a certain kind of um, conscious acceptance, almost take it for granted kind of a vibe. And then being able to sum up these different comments into sort of a whole uh, sort of topic area or a whole concept that the person can take that and see how in each place they're dropping these breadcrumbs and it all leads to a trail. Um, I consider that to be a really good session when, when we can do something like that. And I think that's that aha experience that Gustav mm -hmm. got famous for. Yeah, I mean, for me, part of the aha is deep pattern recognition. Yeah, and that's like right. you say, it's, it spirals and you can see it replicated in there. Yeah, I like the replication part too, what you're talking about. Um, you know, Gestalt as a as an art style or Gestalt as a as a visual style or, or maybe a perceptual style is, you know, one person maybe, you know, looking at the painting and seeing the, the light and shadow, another person seeing the, the the similarity of colors or somebody else's diagonals and how we shift, you know, from one way of perceiving something into another way of perceiving something uh, is so powerful. And flexibility is such a great word for, for each of us as we experience, you know, what flows down the river. And if we get stuck in one mode, uh, I've told people um, it's like photography. You know, you've got the, you turn the lens one way and it's tunnel vision. You turn it the other way and it's the wide view. And on each issue or concept, sometimes people are stuck you know in 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 a tunnel vision let's say and uh it, it, you just want to be able to shift back and forth another great influence for me um god bless her is um judith kopfler uh she was um a uh a phd psychologist who specialized in education and she ran a school here uh, right outside of New Orleans for the students who were pretty lost, who couldn't make it in other schools. And uh, she was responsible for uh, really helping a lot of people over probably a 20 year span. And uh, she was a, a former assistant, uh, a maybe associate director of, of the Gasol Institute of New Orleans in, in my mom's tenure. And uh, I'm sad now because uh, I haven't heard from her in a while. And um, I fear that, you know, she's older. I fear that she's um, uh, maybe uh, losing some of her faculties. And if she's not, I apologize. But my experience has been that, that she is. And um, I think the world of her, and I think that um, she's, uh, been a real big influence for me. She was a big proponent of, of NLP. Another influence of mine just passed away uh, recently was um, Cin Cindy Shelton, uh, yeah, who wrote the yeah, book. Yeah. I have it right here. Uh, Gestalt as a way of life, awareness practices. I thought that Cindy really broke the uh, broke down Gestalt into you know it's a, it's not a big thick tome. Uh, she really broke it down into very digestible sort of uh, uh, experience and concept that the layman can uh, appreciate. And even um, in some cases when myself and um, Dr. Tina Thomas is another one who's um, been a, a big influence on me. She's the director here at the Gestalt Institute and Relationship Center of New Orleans. And, uh, you know, we have trained groups of, of Gestalt practitioners, and um, I think that this book by Cindy Shelton has been real uh, good to help us to get people uh, in, in in a good place, you know, to get out there and to and to understand understand Gestalt, and to also realize that you don't understand Gestalt, you know, and some part of Gestalt is is it would always escape you. But, you know, being humble and being understanding of that, it keeps us from uh, overanalyzing our, our clients and, and, and getting into the right place as we facilitate, the, you know, them being the ultimate authority mm -hmm. on themselves. Yeah, I think it's bold to write the small books because it's not <laughs> simple. Cindy's and Bud Feeder's peeling the onion. And, oh, yeah. And that those was... are not 
those are not easy books, <laughs> but they they bring a lot to them. You, you're right, and I think that um, uh, you know, Gestalt talks about um, uh, about our experiences being palatable and using the metaphor of, of eating, and uh, you know, there's times when we have a great meal and it's not super filling and there's the times when it's in tapas you know the small bites and uh you can savor that more you know there was a kind of a, a zen story about uh somebody wanting to learn how to play the flute or something and the master taught him one note and said so just keep playing this note until it sounds really good to you and it's effortless and it's natural and then come back and i'll teach you the next note and so you know that's really a great way to absorb and digest something uh chew it properly in gestalt terms well another question for you um again starting with the personal and you can take it wherever it goes how have you come to understand and experience yourself in terms of your gender or as a man or in masculinity or however you define yourself and i'm being asked this by a woman how mm -hmm. uh part of how we i think relate to things is how we connect and contact our environment and that's a gestalt principle and our, our culture is our environment uh so for me i'm 63 years old i've gone through some uh decades where the culture itself has had you know certain types of values uh higher and certain other types of values lower um i i feel like the male female question is 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 one way to look at it maybe that's a gestalt but when i work with people um and i've i've talked about this a little bit with with people maybe with women in particular that i've worked with individually um underneath the skin we're all a human being you know underneath the skin we're all uh a, a conscious individual who's you know finding their way through the world the best they can so you know the the male me uh, to myself is is um, is a secondary uh, attribute of me. It's not primary, and I think that that uh, that idea is helpful anyway. Because where we are now, defining somebody by whether they're a, a, a male or female, I don't think that's the core way to to meet or to know someone. Um, although I have run into people who feel it is. And, you know, oh, that's a woman would say a man or, you know, that's a man might say a woman. I think you uh, fall short, though, because uh, we're all conscious individuals. And sometimes I'll say this, I'll say it this way. We're all uh, children of the of the universe or we're all, uh, you know, souls of uh, parts of God on on a path back to heaven and the path may be different. So I want to preface my answer with that. Um, uh, being a being a man uh, for me um, also reminds me of the fact that I think even in in um, several different ways of looking at psychology, maybe Carl Jung in particular, um, will talk about you know the anima is inside of the man, uh, maybe in a a lesser degree than the animus, right? And then vice versa with women. So there should be ways in which we can all identify with whatever the qualities we're talking about that we're using uh, to define um, male or female. Uh, with this meta step that we talked about, I, I don't think anybody should get consciously locked into an automatic way of seeing someone, whether they, want to say you know male or female or they want to say um tall or short or they want to say attractive or not attractive or whatever i mean all of those are biases um i think that um 
maybe the last couple of biases left, um, you know, racial was uh, important, and I think male female was important. But I think some of the biases that are still left over that we haven't really uh, touched or talked about too much are, you know, attractive versus less attractive, or um, I think um, uh, maybe uh, poor versus anything from adequately wealthy up. Um, so I think that um, I think another one is uh, it is a sense of um, I don't quite know what to call it, but there are some people who come off very intelligent in their communication or they're, you know, accomplished in school. Then there are some people who um, perhaps had a lot of trouble in school and aren't really the best communicators. So I think that between those types, I think there's also biases, um, you know, facial biases in a way too, you know, uh, we're reacting to uh, things like that and it's still all just biases. So again, another preface, but you know, I'm happy to be a man. I enjoy my, my male uh, heterosexuality, I guess to say it, but um, I think that uh, with respect, you know, from, um, what is it, um, the viewer to the viewed, you know, with a sense of respect of boundary and and a sense of of um, dignity. I think that you know it's it's nice to be a man. Uh, I don't think that the the stereotypes and the biases um, can be really helpful sometimes, you know, like, oh, I'm supposed to fight or I'm supposed to uh, compete rather than collaborate. But uh, I feel like I'm a happy person and uh, I enjoy life and uh, and I uh, I want to reach out and 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 enjoy things. But I think um, I think in a lot of ways it's still sort of up in the air to define what the genders are. And I come from the past. I was born in the late 50s and I've seen a lot of changes about that so i'm kind of a student of that <laughs> you know yeah, how, no, how did you, it feel when you to said you? biases i mean i'm hearing sort of biases and binaries and mm -hmm. i think we are definitely in a time where there's more awareness of the less polarized experiences mm -hmm. so. how does it feel to you to be uh in, in maybe the way they say it now is to be i self-identified as a woman but how, how do you feel it in in your skin well i i identify as a woman and i always find it interesting to hear men <laughs> speaking sort of from that perspective of you know well it doesn't really matter that much and it it does where when you're in sort of the less oppressed side of any binary and i mean being a woman in my experience may not matter but it's it's again that sort of set of privileges um that are not afforded systemically it's like well i i get to be aware of this because it also makes me aware of a whole bunch of shit that i have to push through mm -hmm. that it's very comfortable for people who don't have to go through that to say ah well you know it's just a category mm -hmm. it's like well it's experienced in different ways on different places in the spectrum. It is, you know, and, and uh, the category of, of uh, stress and trouble that a person goes through pushing through maybe the gender types of issues still ultimately, um, if we categorize someone's issues as only being valid because they're gender issues, then we still discount the fact that, you know, even uh, maybe in your example, uh, the male who doesn't have to deal with those things may still have had a really crappy day at work and dealt with a full plate of issues that may not be about the gender differences. So I think ultimately, you know, and I learned this uh, in, in going through the grief 
of uh, losing my daughter about three years ago, who I was so close to, such a wonderful human being, just got really swept in, swept up in this and just couldn't swim out of it. Um, but uh, the day she died was two days before her son, my grandson's birthday. And uh, his birthday was on Mardi Gras day. And so uh, two days later, uh, and he he's very resilient. He was hanging in there real well, but he says, granddaddy goes, he goes, is it okay if I go to a parade? Can you bring me to a parade? He was like, maybe nine. <clears throat> And I thought, you know what, doggone it, of course, I'm going to bring you to a parade. And uh, I was pretty full of grief at that time. So here I am in, in New Orleans at the parade. And I'm standing at the parade. And the typical parade behavior is people are lining, you know, one side of the street. And then the, the floats and the marchers, you know, are coming through at a slow kind of pace. And the floats are throwing necklaces and doubloons and other things. And I look around me and I'm in this grief and I look around me and I see all these people, you know, like, hey, hey, it's like a party. And I thought to myself, if they knew what had just happened to me and how I felt, you know, if they would, they would know it, but they don't know it because I'm not really expressing it outwardly i'm feeling it inwardly and i was waving my hand a little bit i wanted to be in in that mode for my grandson then i thought to myself one thought past that like wait a minute jeff you don't know how they feel either and i was like that was kind of an aha you know green dot moment for me so i was like they might if I'm here and I could be semi looking like I'm into this and be having this deep, sad feeling here, then maybe some of them do too. And I, and I was just like, wow. And it just had a quantum depth level for me of respect for everybody. And I think, you know, maybe another bias that's sort of on uh, maybe somewhat discussed, but not really delved into is, you know, who's a stranger and who's not, you know, remember Will Rogers, I think it was, I never met a stranger at that thing. But, you know, sometimes if we don't know somebody, we tend to flatten them out, make them two dimensional. You know, of course, they don't have anything going on. Why aren't they paying attention to my thing? And of course, I'm me, so I know all my stuff. But it really kind of it really kind of helped me a lot to realize that anybody I meet on the street at any moment could be about to lose their job, could be you know about to go into surgery, or could have a divorce coming, or could have you know a loved one that just left town or something. And I just realized, that, you know, the complexity and the depth of of people is just something to be just respected and 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 humble about. So, um, yeah, I wanted I wanted to share that part uh, too. I guess while we're talking about, you know, I'm me. You know, who was that? Uh, uh, I and thou kind of uh, part of Gestalt, or maybe was it Boober or somebody that philosoph philosophized about it? But yeah, what makes it me, and why am I so important, <laughs> and why would a stranger? you know, be so less important uh, to to people in general. And um, I think we, you know, some in some cases on the planet, we need to change that. No, I mean, it's, it's certainly not my intention to to minimize or to. Oh, classify yeah, I, I just piggybacked way. off of that, but I didn't yeah, mean no, to apply no, it's, that. It's definitely, I mean, the, the intersectional sort of levels of identity are mm -hmm. always there and we're incredibly complex creatures if <laughs> we're just, i know we, we have a lot of levels yeah I, and we I see it in the know. office you know when somebody mm -hmm. comes in maybe for that first appointment who we really don't know and mm -hmm. then to just have them let down you know sort of what their struggles are and mm -hmm. even sometimes in their history what they've been through uh it's amazing you know to, yeah, i mean i the functional parts i get it well maybe if they're a little drinking or partying too hard maybe they 
those are the slightly dysfunctional parts, but the functional parts go to Mardi Gras, you know, but they've all got the other parts that are with them. Yeah. So you know, speaking that. of functional parts at Mardi Gras, uh, sometimes here in New Orleans, Mardi Gras has been nice and warm and pleasant. And other years, Mardi Gras has been like the cold, humid, fog coming out your mouth, icy winter. But speaking of functional and not functional, a few times in my past, as I've looked down the street and seen just all the rows of people, uh, there's this one guy, different guy, but this one type of guy, he's in blue jeans, his shirt is completely off. Apparently he's been drinking and he is somehow oblivious to the cold, you know, like, like talk about uh, inhibitions, uh, flying away, you know, and, and alcohol coming in. Uh, it's amazing, um, you know, how chemicals can can change our, our brain chemistry. And uh, sometimes it, people's brain chemistry and their inhibitions have been loosened so much that they got themselves in a lot of trouble. And here they are walking into our office to try to sort it out, you know. Yeah, well, I, I think addictions, they say it starts out as an adjustment that works until it doesn't, right? Yeah, that's a good way of putting it. And and it might be your pet adjustment that you just love having <laughs> and it just doesn't work. And you, you know, I, I tell people, uh, it's like, uh, I'm not here to work with you to take away any tools that are in your box. I'm just here to help you add more tools so that you have more choices. And this is a very personal question. I mean, were you able to hold that perspective specifically regarding addictions after what happened with your daughter? Because I know some people become very, you know, absolute sobriety is the only answer and very anti, but mm -hmm. sort of in a radicalized way. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a great question. Um, I'm, I'm more open-minded than close-minded. And then I should say, I'm open-minded more than closed-minded, I think, in order to demo the open-minded part, right? But um, I think that uh, for me, addiction is the hardest. I think, you know, in my opinion, as a student of humanity, I think addiction is the hardest thing to Bite or the hardest thing to, to get change with. And I was talking to somebody at dinner last night, uh, something uh, uh, different about addiction came up. And I said, that the trouble is that with addiction, you really, I believe, have to deal with two things. You have to deal with the addictive habit and the, the way that the brain sabotages the person's actions so that they keep going back to the chemical or whatever it is. And then there's the underlying stuff that created the, the foundation for them to fall into addiction, you know, whether whether that's some sorrow or some guilt or some sadness and, you know, all of those things, you know, in their past or some something, you know. So I think addiction is really hard with my daughter. One of the things I I. I, I sort of evolved to about addiction is that um, I don't want to say it casually because in a different way of saying it addiction is very serious and the research that people have done on it and where we are now is the result of a lot of thinking and a lot of blood sweat and tears and I respect that but in a different kind of way everything's addiction everything you know, we can be addicted to um, to solutions in our minds, to types of solutions in our minds, you know, fight, flight, uh, freeze, perform, um, you know, those types of, uh, of generalized decisions about things. So addiction, in a way, is that thing that comes from under the surface sort of unconscious and it presents use this tool solve it this way and so i've had a lot of respect for the 
people helping work that I do in terms of addictions. Um, that, you know, they say, um, uh, it's been a big philosophical uh, talk here and there about uh, the Bible says thou shalt not judge. And I've thought about that. Uh, I think that we, you kind of have to judge I think maybe the translation is a little off, and I think it should be thou shalt not prejudge. I think it's the assumptions, it's the prejudge, and that gets into the Gestalt stuff, right? Because in Gestalt, here and now is important. You know, this is the here and now moment. I can do this right here. I couldn't have done that two seconds ago, right? The past is sort of down the river, and I can say I'm going to do it in the future but I'd have to get fixated on it. It would take away from my here and now, and I have to remember to do it. So your true power, of course, is right here in the here and now, you know, here is where I have all of my awareness and my ability to act. So I think addiction, it, it, it sort of sells you out from the here and now, and it tells you that there's some fix in the future that you're gonna take that's going to make you feel better or somehow um and i think fritz pearls had said um a lot of times people uh tend to shy away or negativize the the uh, emotions of, of sadness or grief or stress or uh, something that we have to do that's a responsibility or we don't want to do and these that whole group of feelings are actually so constructive, you know, even anger, if it's expressed, you know, in a balanced way with respect to someone else, anger can help you to separate from sort of a current condition or something. So I think ultimately addiction is the mind wanting a shortcut. I don't want to deal with, you know, what's happening here. I don't want to look at it. I don't want to you know, have my feelings about it. I don't want to, you know, roll up my sleeves. I don't want to say that I don't know what to do, you know. So let me just kind of go to the autopilot and it'll say, oh, well, then just go have a drink or, oh, just, you know, run away or, oh, just rant and shout. And so it's, it's, yeah. it's like you get into the real here and now moment. And I think, you know, if you own it and and you let yourself feel it and sense it. And it may be um, your sense of attachment is reasonably secure, you know, and, and you're here and you now. And I think addiction in, in a way is sort of a sense of selling yourself out and going with some canned package or some, you know, genie in a bottle or something that's supposed to. And these habits keep going. So with my daughter, I think that was a big one uh, for me to sort of understand. Um, I had a, a kind of a, a vision experience about my daughter that I, I, I want to bring up here that's interesting too, talking about grief. Um, I would say probably about four or five months after she had passed away, um, I was... Uh, working with um, clients and appointments on like a Saturday afternoon. And I had a, about maybe an hour in between uh, the end of one and the beginning of another one. And I, and I, at that time, didn't live very far from my office. So I thought, well, I'll just go chill at the house and maybe grab something to eat and I'll come back. And uh, on this part of uh, the road that we were on at that time, Metairie Road, there's a train track. And so I got out, got in my car and about a block or two away from the office, there's the train, you know, and the arms are down and it's ding, 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 and the train's going. And sometimes it's a long train. So I thought, well, I'll go around the other way. I'll catch the interstate and loop around. Well, when I got close to where the interstate is over there, that is two minutes away from the cemetery where my daughter is and uh she's buried in the same place as my mom in, in our family tomb here in new orleans we've got a lot of us have these above ground tombs so i thought well shoot let me go see holly so 
I drove over there. It was a nice golden sunlight Saturday afternoon. It wasn't too hot, wasn't too cold. And I was going to do the same thing that I've done, you know, many different times, which is sometimes I'll go, I don't really have an agenda. I'll just sort of be present. And so this time I did that and I put my hand on the tombstone where I know right on the other side in that jar, there's Holly and uh, friends of my mom would be happy to know that my mom's jar is right next to hers on that shelf. Anyway, so I put my hand there and something happened. I had like a like a waking dream or a vision or something. Um, I wasn't very much at all aware of a guy standing in, in a cemetery. Instead, I had this sort of this pretty vivid picture of my daughter standing with a couple of people behind her that I couldn't really make out, but she's standing there and she had a lot of light, not Hollywood light coming out of her, but she was very well lit and she had a very confident smile on her face and I could feel her eyes and it made me feel good just to perceive her that way. And she tells me this, she says, dad, she says, I need you to stop getting so focused on your grief so you can get the strength I'm sending you. And I hadn't really thought about that. I mean, I, it's not oh. something I was thinking about. It just came to me like out of left field. And I thought, wow. Right as I said that, somebody behind her was my mom. And my mom says the same thing. And so I'm like, wow. Then on the other side of her, here's my two grandparents. My, my grandfather's buried there. And they said the same thing. So I'm kind of in this cycle. Then on the other side of my mom, here's Jesus, the holy car Jesus, and he says it. So I'm like, wow. And then I just sort of some, and I realized I'm a guy standing in a cemetery with his hand on the thing. So it was a really interesting moment, you know, talk about foreground background, you know, and um, I'm like, I really have to take that message to heart. You know, it's like, I think it's true for all of us, but for me, it's like, you know, the grief was the first part of this and it, it has caused me other insights such as the one I told you about the, at the parade. Um, and, I, and I just thought strength meaning, you know, uh, sort of instinct and self-trust and, uh, uh, self-validation and, and a sense of, uh, of uh, helping other people from the right place inside myself. And, um, and I'm, I'm working on a, on a book on a topic that I use with my uh, clients. It almost always comes up at some point in some of the earlier sessions of what I call friendly strength. And, you know, I think in our culture, what we're basically handed is the idea that we um, that strength means maybe this is a little male female stuff too, but that strength means um, hostility, like a football game or something. You know, it's like I'm the home team, the other person's the visitor. You know, I'm gonna bump into them, knock them down, and go get goodies from their end zone. Um, it's a competition. Um, I'm going to probably hurt you or bruise you, or I'm going to diminish you or something, but it can't be helped. This is the nature of disagreement. And well, you'd do it to me, wouldn't you? You know? Um, and then I think that the other thing that we get handed in our culture about that is maybe the, uh, the other position, I think you called it uh, duality or something, you know, the other position is the, the person who sort of capitulates or gives in or accommodates, you know, it's like, well, look, I can see this is going to launch from bad to worse. I can see the other person is going to, you know, put all this hostile power on me and it's going to be like a terrorist incident or it's just no way to redeem this. So I'm just going to give in. And I'm gonna let them have their way. I think that's the opposite of hostile strength. I think that's friendly, but it's weak. And so 
the strength and weak have to do with how you represent yourself, your needs, your opinion, your favorite flavor, whatever it is, you know, and how much you sort of capitulate or give in to the other person. Each one of those positions has a problem. You know, with the, with the weak part of friendly weak at the end of the day, you may well be sort of going to sleep and thinking, geez, I lost, lost one again, you know. In, in the beginning of it, you may think, well, I'm being saintly, I'm a harmonizer, I'm a helper. Um, maybe that's the friendly part. So there's some positives in there because you transmit some sort of understanding and donating to the other person. And I think with the friendly, with the um, hostile strength, the strength part is I've represented what I want, I've stood up for myself, but the hostile is how you treat the other person. So I think the new approach and what I'm writing in this book is in the friendly strength is how you can have both together. And the way that you get both together is you approach it differently, maybe in an advanced sort of evolved way of handling a disagreement. So the first part is between strong and weak. Am I going to be strong and defend and take care of my position, my needs, or what I think is best, or even if it's just my favorite flavor, right? Am I going to take care of myself? If so, then I'm going to be strong, as opposed to I'm not going to surrender this and, and sort of uh, desert myself. So that's the first step. Go inside, regardless of the environment. Don't consider that yet. Just go in and find out who you are, where you are. If, if uh, I would take a five out of 10, that's my truth, you know, and maybe I would settle for a six or a four, or maybe I wouldn't, but if I would, then I'm not going to take seven, eight, nine, ten, and I'm not going to take three, two, one. Just know where you are, know who you are. Then the next part is, that's how I treat myself. The next part is, how am I going to treat the other person? So by having it in those two perspectives, it's like I can have what I want, but I'm not going to be hostile to the other person. I'm going to be friendly. So you get the you pull the friendly and you pull the strong. And what is friendly really? Friendly is a tone of voice. It's a way of looking at somebody, you know, so that they feel seen and respected. Um, sometimes it's it's sort of a, an I language rather than a you you you. Um, Another one is, uh, is don't fix the person, fix the problem. You know, is I don't have to put you down. I don't have to impugn you. Let's look at the system approach and let's figure out, you know, maybe we buy a second garage door opener and then we're not fighting over who has the garage door opener anymore. You know, it's like well, we really, so what all this friendly strength does is it doesn't automatically fix the problem, but it fixes the relationship between the two people so that each person can be open and honest and put it out there on the table, the pieces, and then we collaborate, not compete. And we start putting it together. And another problem with people arguing is sometimes that assumption has to happen now. We have to settle it now. It's got to happen right now, you know, but if we understand it doesn't always have to happen right now you know uh it's not really a right now thing most things then we give ourselves some time um i saw one time at an advertising meeting uh uh one of the speakers was somebody i often wanted to meet never thought i would a person who writes the greeting cards for like hallmark or something and i thought oh i gotta go hear this guy you know and afterwards uh uh he talked for 15 or 20 minutes afterwards, I just wanted to shake his hand. It was an older guy, kind of Santa Claus looking, of course. <laughs> but uh, uh, I said, can you give me a pointer or anything about, you know, uh, your talk or any kind of one thing? And he thought about it and he said, I'll give you one. He said, creativity. He said, people think that we just pop these things out that are in these cards. He said, most of the time, you know, we'll write out this, write out that, write out this and that. And he said, and then you go away. He said, instead of forcing yourself, it has to be now, you go away and you do something else. And then you come back, he said, and just surprisingly, you know, you'll add to it or something will happen. And so that's what I tell people too in, in, the, in the friendly strength and the disagreement uh, stuff. And what I'm putting in the book is, is uh, respect creativity as something that sometimes just is, is beyond your own volition. It takes some time. Mm -hmm. So people yeah, can comes back to the Zinker's creative process. <laughs> yes, that's right. Yeah, thank you for that. Yeah, I like mm -hmm. I like his book a lot. I love the diagrams he put in it. 
uh, you know, and certainly uh, Joseph Zinker's background, having to deal with World War II and those things in his family. Uh, but yeah, so it's a creative process that we respect, you know, that, you know, sort of a sense of uh, not having to handle it all yourself. And I think relaxing into disagreements, I think, is real important. So um, I think friendly strength is a good one, and that might apply back to sort of how I see myself as a man and, and how I see women and, and, you know, people even underneath the gender who's just, we're just human beings we're eternal divine souls talking to eternal divine souls here. So, you know, let's have a respect for each other and, and never sort of um, take each other for granted. And, uh, you know, until I talk to you, just like talking to a client, you know, I just have to respect that I got no idea all the stuff, you know, the crises that you've got ahead of you that you're going through now and what you succeeded on in the past. And so, that's a big part of my uh, outlook uh, with people. Yeah, and I think, you know, through that last part there, there were a lot of questions that you asked and answered for me. <laughs> I um, tend to do that at some time. Yeah, no, that's, that's fair, but it's interesting. I mean, if you think about how much space the clients usually take up in the consulting room, I'm. it's interesting to know, I mean, for me, part of this is, is letting the therapist take up a space as a human being, you know, with a story, with a way of thinking, with a perspective, because we're not blank slates. I mean, we do come in with a full presence that's very complex. Yeah, you so, know, the, the office, the, the, the therapist's office, uh, it, it, I remember hearing this in the Gestalt, uh, the Gestalt cosmology, that um, it's a laboratory. It's a separate, private, lab away from your everyday real world and you can try things out in here and you can be okay trying them out and you can be safe and you know you're the scientist in the lab coat you know we go through it you know i'll give you my honest human feedback as just one person out of many but i'm i'm a sort of a test subject you can ask questions about this and that too and it can be kept private and secure and ultimately um, after you do that you'll have a different perspective you may have done something or spoken to some powerful family member or something in your life in a way that you never would have done before so much never have done it that you that you suppressed it into repression you don't even realize you could speak that way um, I, you know, get a, a little bit of a satisfaction with a sort of a slight smile when, uh, and you've probably done this too, and all of us Gestalt people and all of us people helpers maybe have been in a spot where we said, if you could talk to your parent-in-law and really tell them how you feel, just honestly and caringly, but just really put it out there, what would you say? You know, put him, put him in that chair and, and just say what you would say. And they're like, I can't say it. And and to me, my perspective is, this is imaginary. I'll tell them that sometimes. I'll say, this is completely imaginary. I said, you're in, look around, you're in this office. You know, uh, you're, I'm here. I'm not telling anybody what you say. It was on your client intake form. You get your privacy and confidentiality. I said, I'm just asking you to try it out. It's an empty chair there. But that's how powerful, you know, these these uh, these interjects are, or, you know, perhaps other sorts of contact boundary distortions. But, you know, it, how powerful the, the brain is, you know, the part of the brain that maybe is the autopilot part that's just been shutting these people down, you know, for a long time and then they say it and it's like <sighs> amazing and yet it was it was uh it was a uh, virtual experience it was uh but it was enough because when we reorganize ourselves through that stack of of thoughts and emotions and and sensations and awarenesses uh it, it becomes kind of true on the inside, you know, what used to not be true on the inside, 
now becomes true and what was true now becomes not true. I ask people to respect, um, another thing I like to ask them is uh, to respect not knowing. There's so many times we think, I gotta know, I gotta have something, give me a card, give me something, <laughs> right? And it's like, have you ever just sat and not known, you know? And and I, I'll tell them that sometimes, they'll say, good. I'll say, let's just hang out for like, you know, maybe 10 or 20 seconds, not knowing, and let's just relax and just, well, it's that hanging out in that piece of your pie where you know that you don't know. <laughs> That's right. It is. It's, in that special it's actually part. admitting it. Mm -hmm. Sitting in the consciousness of not knowing for what. Yeah. And you know that, that thing about uh, Gestalt sometimes, uh, I think it's Gestalt, is, is it's not how I feel, but it's what I think and feel about how I feel. You know, it's that extra layer. You know, it's like, maybe growing up i mean you know some family structures especially the old older ones it's like you better you better not not know what you're going to say to that parent when they come in there mm -hmm. with that brooding look yeah and if well, you i mean grew it's, up it's and like, lived in it yeah yeah it, it sort of cycles back for me to sort of grieving and birthing and dying and it's i mean there are processes which just happen but mm -hmm. there's so much that gets in the way of or, or tries to hold back something that is pretty inevitable. Mm -hmm. Kind of like uh, able... trauma is like that. Mm -hmm. You just get overloaded, you know, mm -hmm. or at least at the time, based on what it looked like, that's what happened. You were overloaded. And so it's, it's a big lump in your throat or something. Sorry, I was just going to say, you know, the grieving and birthing and dying it just happens, but the complicated part is what we put on top of that mm -hmm. and what and we what don't the culture, let ourselves go through with. Yeah, yeah and what the, the culture has put on it, what our family has put on it, what our religion puts on it, uh, how we handle anxiety or how we don't, you know, puts on it. Um, those are big things that you mentioned. And in a metaphor, they happen several times a day to each of us. They do. They do. You know, dying mm. is is similar in some ways, uh, uh, in a simple uh, analogy to when you go to sleep at night. You know, it's like you lay down in your bed and the lights go off and you close your eyes and there's not going to be anything that you have to do and you slip into unconsciousness. And it's a good model, you know. Um, and then we wake up, we're reborn, we're reincarnated, you know, into the incredible world of possibilities and experiences. And a day is a long time. It's all kinds of stuff that happens in a day. And in a day, I'm being the absolute best me that I have ever been. You know, I've got the absolute most life experience today compared to yesterday. And, you know, a week ago, oh, my God, that was lifetimes back. <laughs> well, I, I am unfortunately aware of time today. Uh, so I'm wondering if it's OK with you if we sort of leave this with some not knowing, because there is a yeah, lot more to that. you there. Um, we can think about whether we'd like to do a second part or not. But okay. is there anything else you'd like to say right now? uh thank you for having me uh it's a nice feeling uh doing this because i know that it is on a platform that it can reach people and some of those people are other people helpers and some insights that i've shared may be similar to what they've already got but if any piece or part or way to put it together is different or helpful to them then that is an incredible uh pleasure for me to be able to to share some of these ideas that i've had um and uh i i really thank you for doing it and um i want to go back and look at some of your other shows and see uh you know what some other people have said gestalt is an incredible uh, incredible style and incredible group of concepts uh, which i think is very advanced really advanced you know about uh, contact boundary 
about uh, awareness, sort of about uh, foreground background and existentialism and uh, things that are, are still advanced in terms of our, our understanding. And, and they're not really things that we're supposed to fully know everything about. It's really an approach that helps us to handle the not knowing part and just to accept ourselves as advanced conscious beings and, and to, uh, to do our best in the world with ourselves and others. So um, yeah, this has been great. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you. It's really nice to meet you. Yep, you have a great rest of your day and all you people out there, I wish you the very best. Thanks. Okay, thank you.